I planned this video to be short, but it is not. <laughs> it's hard to condense so much beautiful information into a few words. So what I suggest you do if you don't want to watch a whole half hour of me explaining different vegetable seed varieties and so forth, have a look at the timings list that we put with this and you could just dive in at any vegetable that you particularly want to find information about. Seed. Where it all begins. It's crunch decision. Getting hold of good seed, choosing which seed to buy. So this is mainly this video is about my advice from based on long experience of what varieties or cultivars of each vegetable do well. And that's obviously in, in my climate here, temperate oceanic. Uh, actually will be quite constant across a broad spectrum of, of climates, uh, but you might need to make some variations if you're some much hotter or colder location. And then uh, before just launching into that, to mention that the possibility of saving your own seed is always in the background here. So if you, when you find varieties you really like, uh, do some homework on how feasible it might be for you to save seed. Every vegetable is different and some vegetables need much more space because you have to have quite a few plants. A few vegetables you can do it with just one plant, like pea, lettuce, French bean, tomato. Brilliant, so they're the easy ones. And then when you're buying seed, um, that's not so straightforward. You know, like uh, this thing of how, it's not always clear how fresh the seed is when you buy it. Uh, if you find a supplier that you find you can trust over the years, sometimes it can take a while to work that one out. Like one of my favorite ones worldwide is, is in Germany, actually, Bingenheim. Sap good and sadly because of Brexit in Britain we find it hard now to buy seeds from then direct uh, but there's a, a seed company I like in um, Devon called Tamar Organics who import their seeds so you can get them there and they do good organic seed as well and one other brilliant company I'd mention is Real Seeds which is kind of iconic and unusual because they really do grow all their own seed it's quite an unusual thing uh, most seed companies who are selling seed that a lot of them they're buying in and they'll they might be raising some of their own you know that's normal but real seeds pretty much grow them all in the uk uh, they contract them out different people around and, and you get a nice choice unusual um, varieties and types so let's just go through i've i've picked out about 14 different vegetables <laughs> not a whole lot it would take too long but to give you some ideas and and, and it's about sort of categories and how you actually make your choices. There is a page on my website called Seeds and Varieties, which has a lot of this information and my book, in fact, No Dig, which has a lot of info about each vegetable, including the varieties I recommend. So beetroot, here's a nice example between home safe seed and seed you might buy. So that's some seed that we saved last year from not many plants. If you save seed, often you get a lot. And that's nice. You know, it's sort of thing you could share out um, with your mates or on an allotment or something. A few of you save seeds and then share them out at the end of the year. And you know they're fresh. Because what I've noticed with beetroot seed was <laughs> last year I was sowing seed that I'd saved the year before, that had grown the year before. So, sorry, not the year before, the year before that even. I'd saved it for a whole year and we're sowing it that spring after keeping it for a year. And I thought, is this going to come up so well, you know, compared to the year before when it was fresh? It came up really well, close to 100%, which is kind of telling me a bit that why, why, why is it then sometimes you buy seed and it really doesn't come up well? Uh, is it something we're doing wrong? I'm, I'm in a position now where I can pretty much be sure that it's the fault of the seed. You know, I know what I'm doing normally. And also I often have a side-by-side -side comparison. You, you can see one batch you sowed, or that I sowed, it's just not coming up well and you know them well that's the seed and I can assure you it happens more often than you might like to imagine if you're just starting out you think well if someone's selling seed surely they're going to only sell seed that really is going to grow I'm afraid it isn't always like that so don't always blame yourself don't be discouraged if your seed doesn't come up react if seeds haven't germinated say within a week for most seeds um, certainly within two weeks for most seeds buy another packet from somewhere else don't wait forever hoping it will come up because it's probably defective seed so beetroot, this is the variety I particularly like. It's called Boltardi. And it's one reason I like it is it, it grows early and you haven't got to worry about it bolting. That's why it's called Boltardi. So you can sow it even middle of February undercover to transplant middle to late March with fleece over. And then you've got different types of beetroot. So in terms of just, it's not only a question of variety. You've got yellow beetroot 
uh, the Detroit's a nice one, and uh, depending who saved it, obviously, because the quality varies according to how its seed has been saved. And then you've got the long ones like Cylindra. Uh, one I'd recommend actually is this one, uh, Cheltenham Green Top, which Green Top, because the leaves are green, it has uh, more of a pink than a deep red root, but it's, it's red and it goes quite long. So it does store very well because it's more underground, protected from frost and the flavor's pretty nice. It's slightly sweeter, I would say, than many other beetroots. Not quite so earthy, but you know, what do you want? This is where finding a variety you like, uh, it won't necessarily be the one that someone else likes. And so it's worth trying a few to experiment. With uh, broccoli, that's certainly the case because there's so many types of broccoli and uh, you need to be sure that you've got the right type. I get quite a few queries every year, every autumn from people who grow broccoli and they say, my broccoli's not heading up. It's so, I'm really frustrated. What should I do? Should I just take out the plants? I say, well, just read the seed packet. What does it say? And quite often they'll come back to me and say, oh yeah, it's a spring uh, heading type. So in other words, it's, it's been bred, it's designed to go through the winter and not make a head until March, April, even May. So you need to know that when you sow it and when you're waiting for your harvest. So read the small print, which describes for each say type of broccoli. And the, the two main types I might mention here is one is Calabrese, and we call it Calabrese anyway, that's Calabresia in Southern Italy where they, it's originated. Big, big domed heads, uh, the big green broccoli that supermarkets quite often sell. And not so many side shoots. If you want more side shoots, look at um, tender stem types and all the old fashioned non-hybrid broccolis are, are good for that. And then um, we've got the overwintering ones. And one I particularly like of that is called Claret. That makes a nice big purple head in the spring, uh, if that's what you want. And uh, Claret, but the old fashioned varieties I found have, have not been bred or maintained very well and they just don't give you much harvest. And that's certainly true for Brussels sprouts. Um, by the way, I'm not recommending specifically any seed co company here, but you'll notice some are mole seeds, um, just because that's where I happened to buy some last year. Uh, I keep trying different seed companies because <laughs> that's part of my research and, and for informing you. Uh, th these people were okay, N nothing remarkable. King said so they're okay. Uh, you know, you get some good ones, some bad ones. Um, so F1 hybrids for Brussels sprouts. I'm no fan of the F1 hybrid process, but sometimes there's no choice if you, you know, Brussels sprout, you're going to sow it, you're going to plant it, you're going to look after it for many months, it's going to take up a lot of space in your garden. If you buy a seed of a non well maintained variety, an open pollinated variety, you're going to be putting all that time, space, and effort into not much result. It's pretty galling and dispiriting. And I hear of that happening a lot. But with hybrids, they've been carefully bred. Um, now, I'm not saying for one minute I approve the process, <laughs> but I'm just saying it's the, the main choice we have. Brendan and Bridget in particular. Bridget for before Christmas, more Brendan for after Christmas. Quite tall plants, if you want a shorter one, try Doric. For example, they're all F1 hybrids. And this is an interesting, nice variation, which is flower sprout, and that's kale cross sprout. That is a hybrid again. And they grow very tall plants. And um, I won't name and shame here, but I bought some last year from a different seed company. They didn't come up. It, clearly old seed. You know, that's the sort of thing that can happen. And then cabbage. So this is a cabbage is a huge spectrum of possibilities. You've got the different types according to the season. Spring cabbage, summer cabbage, autumn cabbage, and winter cabbage. So winter cabbage, for example, savoy. You sow it in June, July, and you, they're very hardy. That's why it's winter cabbage. You could grow savoys in autumn more, but I value them mainly for winter because they're so frost hardy. They don't really make a tight head that would split open with frost. So working backwards from winter, you're in the autumn and then you've got the big cabbages, the big hearty ones that are great for sauerkraut, like feldkraut is a brilliant one, lovely pointy white one. And then you've got granat, I particularly like, it's a very dense red one. You know, I've grown side by side with red drumhead, for example, and the red drumhead made very small heads by comparison. And I just don't think it's been well maintained by the whoever's breeding it or keeping the seed. And then uh, they need quite a long season of growth, so you sow them, say, early May, whereas the summer cabbage tend to grow a little bit more quickly uh, sow them in early spring and they will head up or heart up. Um, there's some hybrids, there's some open pollinated ones, uh, stonehead, cabbies. Uh, greyhound has gone off a bit, again, not being well maintained, I would say. And that really greyhound is more a spring cabbage, which is you can also get by overwintering. So you sow them in late 
August to transplant late September and they're only ever small. So just make sure again, read the small print on your cabbage seed packet so that you know what you're growing and when the harvest is likely when you're going to be looking out to pick your cabbage. Carrots makes a huge difference having a good type of seed and a good variety. Raymond Blanc did a taste test with all his chefs and found that of the 42 varieties they tasted, early Nantes was the best. And it's a pretty bog standard variety. You can get it in hybrid or in open pollinated. And this one I found that I particularly like, that's some home sow seed of it, is called Trinatala. It's from the town of Trinatal in Germany. And the non carrots are particularly long, actually, I do value that. If you want a really funny long one, there's this one here, it's called Sugar Snacks and it is a hybrid and actually that here grows so long that I have trouble getting them out even so you know you can have fun with carrots and they, they come in all different colors you can have yellow ones white ones um, wouldn't necessarily recommend any of those particularly it's, it's, it's what you want this is the beauty of choosing your varieties uh, this one is good oxella that's home safe seed again and I like that because it has a short fat uh, shape which holds the moisture it's high dry matter it stores really well for winter and actually carrot root fly find it a little bit more difficult to eat compared to other carrots but they still manage to and then we have uh, an interesting selection which i've grouped all together because it's very similar in terms of growing habit uh, cucumber melon and loofah i'll sm quickly mention loofah because if you've not tried loofah uh, sea spring seeds is a really nice seed company in dorset and they they grow their own loofah seeds and that's where I got mine originally. Um, saved my own now, but I'm thinking I might buy some more because I think I need more plants to get the cross pollination. And it's it's a beautiful thing to make to grow. Uh, you know, everyone's always amazed. You grew your own loofah. Then melons. Uh, melons need warmth, and a few I've saved seed. Um, again, though, it's about finding the one that you like. There's so many different types. I particularly recommend Ogan type of melon. That's because that in, in cooler climates, especially that can grow mature, slightly quicker, sweet, Charente type. Emia F1 is also very nice. Do check out my melon growing video for that. And cucumber. So cucumber is a big one because, you know, you can eat a cucumber every day, or at least I certainly can in the summer. And wow, what a plant to have that just keeps growing. And if you get one that produces a regular supply of sweet cucumber, it's Carmen F1. But that's a cordon type to grow undercover. Outdoors, you can also have fantastic, in, in temperate climates even, where it's reasonably warm in the summer. And I'd recommend Tanya or La Diva or Market More. All of those are good. They're just ridge cucumbers, they're called, different type. They sprawl on the ground, very low maintenance, easy to grow. Do have a go at them if you've not tried cucumbers before. You'll be pleasantly surprised as long as your summer daytime temperatures are above maybe 21 centigrade, 70 Fahrenheit. Kale. Wow, what a choice we have in kale, uh, much more than we ever used to. And you've got curly types, flat leaf type, particularly I'd recommend Red Russian. It's a gorgeous flat leaved uh, tender because it's flat leaved. The, the curly ones tend to be a little bit tougher, more frost hardy actually. But the Red Russian you can chop in or pick small for salad as well. And you can almost have it year round um, if you sow some later in the year as well as in the spring. And check in the seed packet whether it tells you it's a tall type or a dwarf type like there's dwarf green curled it's really good for small gardens i'd say because you know it doesn't get too big it's quite productive it doesn't get much higher than about 40 centimeters uh, 16 inches easy plant to grow and then we have <laughs> lettuce next that's how i categorize them it's something out about uh, i'm doing growing on a bit larger scale than you probably but even on a small scale it's good to sort your seeds in a way that you can easily find them and particularly at that point of time when it comes to sow seeds i've had many frustrating ones i can't find the blooming things and you're all ready to sow and so i spent a bit of time in the winter just categorizing them all and this is because i'm a commercial salad grower a lot of lettuce varieties there which i'll be sowing in uh, towards the end of february uh, it's a good time to start sowing lettuce and Choosing varieties, if you can find a variety called Navara, that's a beautiful red oak leaf, much more productive than red salad bowl, for example. It makes such a difference having a productive variety. Saragossa is an amazing Batavian type, so that's uh, crisp round leaves, uh, not crisp like a, an iceberg, but just snappy 
and that's a Batavian type, warmly recommend that. And then of COS types, any tall green one like Paris Island or Winter Density. Well, I managed not to say too much about lettuce. <laughs> Onion is another vegetable that has a huge spectrum of possibilities. So if we start with globe onions, uh, that means bulb onions. Uh, the one I really like is called Ros Rose de Roscoff or Caravelle. And if you find one you really like, it's, I like it because it's, it's a beautiful shape and color, pink and easy to grow, it matures quite early actually, early July rather than early August. And I save seed from it. So again, do check out seed saving information books, videos, we've put out a few. And if you find one you like, keeping seed of onions worthwhile because onion seed does not store very well. I'd rank it with parsnips in terms of being the more difficult to store of all the seeds. Compared to say tomatoes is one of the longest, you can keep them up to eight years. So that one, uh, I've got plenty, that was just last year. You know, you end up when you sow seed, um, I'll see if I can sell a few actually, and then this variety I'd recommend is called Globo. Uh, it's a bit of fun. I tried it last year just to see. And I'll go again because beautiful big onions, they're a bit like show onions and they're quite mild, uh, but they don't store very well. So that's something else to consider. You know, there's, every variety has traits that you need to get to know. That's the advantage of when you find one you really like, you know what it's going to do, how it's going to behave. And for red, onion, red onions, I'd say Red Baron. Over, over all the ones I've tried over many years, it's pretty consistently good. Uh, I prefer to grow onions from seed. If you grow them from sets, you haven't got quite so much choice, but Red Baron's pretty consistent. And then a spring onion. There's also a red spring onion called Lilia, and that, that one gives nice results. I've also grown that to maturity, which you can do and, and use it as a red onion. It doesn't store quite so long as Red Baron, for example. And then the standard white spring onion, I find the easiest over many decades is white Lisbon, and it's pretty much maintained its quality. Uh, but there are different types of onions, which is like the Japanese bunching onion type or fistulosum, which don't make bulbs at all, so they just get bigger. But I found them a little bit prone to mildew. I would say with white Lisbon, you can't really grow wrong. Um, what's different between spring onion and bulb onion is not a lot, but more propensity to bulb up, more propensity with the spring onion to make lots of leaf and more green, which is what we want for that. Radish, just quick mention for a variety called Rudy, R-U-D-I. Over many years I've found consistently that's beautiful radish, lovely round red ones, uniform size and shape, and they keep their quality for much longer than say French breakfast, they don't go woody or soft so quickly. Peas, look at this. This is what I've saved this year. Pretty much actually there's one or two from last year, but it's crazy. Once you start saving a pea seed, it's so easy. You just leave one plant. Pea doesn't cross pollinate. So it's one of those four vegetables with lettuce, French bean and tomato that you can do really simply. And because when you're picking peas, you're only three or four weeks away from having seed. So for podding peas, I'd warmly recommend the Hurst Green Shaft. But there are so many. Kelvedon Wonder, that's another great one. Uh, for snap peas, there's one called Tall Sugar, but I don't think you can get it anymore. So if you find one like that, you have to keep your own seed forever sort of thing. Uh, but there's different types of snap peas. That's where you eat the pod and the interior. Um, then you've got Mange 2 peas. So just make sure when you're buying your pea, it's a very individual thing, what kind of pea you like. Uh, but make sure you know it's the type of pea, so you know when to pick it, like a Mange 2 pea will get stringy if you let it get too fat, so pick it young. And whether it's going to be a short one or a tall one, because you, then you'll provide the relevant support for it to grow. I'll, I'll leave you to have some fun there. Um, and then potatoes. This is interesting, because the, these are just eating potatoes from the kitchen, which I pulled out of a box, and I could keep these for seed. If I was going to keep that one for seed, I'd actually take off the shoots, or the long ones, because they probably get damaged in planting. If you say peas, potatoes are about this sort of size, egg size roughly, that means you're not losing too much food. Um, if it's a bigger potato, you could cut it in half. And uh, in January, February, put them somewhere light, you know, it does not sunny necessarily, but just light windowsill. And what that does, it'll instead of the potato growing long white shoots such as these, which is what it does in darkness, if you keep it in a sack, you want it in light and it's gonna go green. The actual seed potato will look horrible and green, even black, but it's, it's fine. And the shoots will be shorter. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to have short, stubby shoots. It's growing slowly. They're, they've got a lot of energy in them. You put them in the ground in 
late March, April, and they shoot away quickly. So you, you just you gain a bit of time. But more than anything, you stop this happening. What you don't want these long shoots that break off because you can't get them in the ground. So that's what shitting or sprouting potatoes is about. And it, I found it's fine to keep your own seeds. So you, if you've got eating potatoes from last year still in a sack somewhere, say outside or in a house, whatever, uh, just go through them and pick out the medium sized ones, rub off the long shoots, put them somewhere light and you've got your seed potato. And I'd recommend Charlotte is <laughs> number one. That's the second early. Obviously there's so many types of potato and it depends whether you want. Make sure you, you know whether you've got a first early, second early or main crop, the type, the category, and within that find one that you like the flavor of. And then tomatoes, just to finish on these, because probably the most popular vegetable to grow and what a choice we have in tomatoes. And again, they're quite easy to save seed from. I don't know where to start really. Perhaps I'll mention one or two just that I particularly come to mind is Berner Rose. Uh, that's from the Swiss town of Bern in Switzerland in the Alps. And it's a pink beef tomato, not the biggest beef tomato, but beautiful texture and flavor. And what I valued it for last summer here particularly was <clears throat> a, a cool, damp July. It was a very steady ripener. So if you're in a, a less hot climate, the Berner Rose can be a way of having lovely tomatoes in those conditions. And if you want nice cherry tomatoes, again, huge spectrum uh, choice, they will come about three weeks earlier. So I'd recommend having at least one or two cherry plants because just to get the earlier tomatoes like Sun Gold Gardener's Delight, Sweet aperitif, really, the list is almost endless. And then, yeah, for something a bit unusual to finish is the ox heart type of tomato, which uh, a bit rainbow color, and you cut in and you've got some yellows and orange and pink and red in there as well. And they're great flavor. A lot of flavor comes from the soil though and how you grow them, you know, it's not only in the variety. And so that's the beauty of growing at home. For outdoor tomatoes, you can have, again, bush types or cordon types and Last year, I had some great success with new breeding from Austria or relatively new Prima Bella, Resi Bella, if you can get them. They're very blight resistant and there's also Crimson Crush likewise. Uh, it's worth looking out for in temperate climates because that can so much spoil what the harvest otherwise. You won't get a huge harvest probably, but if the summer's fine, it can be surprising and very worthwhile. And I hope that you will have fun buying and then saving seed as well.